right, everybody. We thought we were done for the day recording, and my brother over there, Mr. Schmidt, gave me a wonderful idea that I think we need to continue. We were just about to go edit all our material from our last recap of Leviticus, and he brought up the fear of death and how we are all controlled by it, rather it be... Well, I'll, I'll let him tell you. Why don't you just go into it, Mr. Schmidt, because I, I need to hear this, and I think everyone else does too. Well, I was about to close my book, my big journal of uh, thoughts and philosophy, and I uh, just said, uh, I got a little gnat flying around me here. There's a, uh, we are all controlled by the fear of death, as Trey just said, and that is... In every action that we take, whether it's conscious or unconscious, we are controlled by dying. That is, you know, why are people afraid to jump out of a plane? They're afraid to die. Uh, why are you afraid of being on a roller coaster? You're afraid of dying. You know, why are people afraid to go fast? Uh, they're afraid of dying. Why are they, uh, uh, why are what, you know, good people, why are they afraid to go into the, bad parts of town uh, they're afraid of getting hurt and dying they are afraid why are people that have never read the bible from cover to cover why are they afraid to talk about it and ask questions about it because they are afraid of what's going to happen when they die it, it, I always question why are these true believers that think every word in the bible is true and that they are sure they're going to heaven when you ask them why are they afraid of death? If you're so 100% confident in it, and I mean, I get understanding not wanting to die, but that is one of those things that I've struggled with for years because everyone and everything dies. What's there to be afraid of? To the well-organized mind, death is but the next great adventure. Well, especially in the country that... Uh we live in when everybody thinks well i say everybody in a generality of course the the majority of people in this country think that they're going to what the bible says is paradise or heaven and they're going to live out their days with this um so far this god who is somebody that i'm pretty sure i don't want to go hang out with for eternity unless he changes his ways as we continue through the bible but they think they're going to be in this grand place. And what do you do in this grand place anyway? What do you do in heaven? I always think of Richard Pryor back in the 80s and 90s doing his stand-up on what is heaven. I always think of him talking about 100 million people practicing the harp. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't sound like a great place. <laughs> Thanks, Richard. You're somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I hope he's, it'll be really funny if he's practicing the harp. <laughs> But I mean, really, heaven is the Christians believe it has got to be some kind of terribly boring place. I don't, I don't know. Uh, obviously, nobody knows. But it is interesting that you say, why are people afraid of anything in this country if they think they're going to heaven? And for that matter, why are not funerals a massive celebration instead of a cry fest and a feel sorry for you fest instead of a celebration of life and the journey beyond to their heaven. Instead, it's sad and somber. I have always wondered that ever since I was a child. I always thought, why is, why is this a sad event? I mean, first off, you practice this Christianity your whole life and you think you're going to a better place. Well, shouldn't you just be happy for them on that account? And then secondly, a lot of the times when you're a kid, people die because they're old or they're sick. And it was a big pain relief for a lot of people. Like, why is euthanasia illegal in our country? First off, you're an adult. You should be able to make your own decisions about life and or death. Well, I definitely agree with you on that. You know, and I do think that for the most part, I mean, not every uh, funeral should be, you know, just happy. You know, you don't want to, it's difficult to celebrate uh, the life of someone who left this earth early at a young age or, you know, in their, if they were a child, yes. or, or, or in their prime or, uh, or someone who had some sort of problem. I, I get that. But for the, for the most part, 
It should be a celebration. It should be a celebration. And uh, even in even in the more sad times where there was some sort of uh, tragic event, then it, you know if you're a Christian, you still would have some sort of peace or comfort or peace of mind going. Oh well, at least they're in a a better place. They've overcome you know whatever issue they may have had or whatever. Uh, but that's not how this country acts. This country is uh, very self-focused and very in the moment. I mean, all you got to do is look on any social media. I mean, everybody is self, self, self. I've always thought, going to your point, of self, self, self and sad funerals. And when I was a kid, I always thought that funerals should be happy and birthdays shouldn't celebrate you. What did you do? You just showed up. It should be a celebration to your mother and death should be a celebration of your life and what was in it. To me, the whole country and the way everything works is so backwards. I never understood it as a kid. I always spent my time like, why am I so confused and everybody else gets this? <laughs> <laughs> so that's why we have to go and explore these things on our own as adults and start our own church, apparently, to figure it out. I, you know, I think... I think you hit something right on the head. I don't know why anybody celebrates a birthday. You didn't do anything. <laughs> you just showed up. Yeah, there's nothing here. You should celebrate your mother. Yeah. Uh, hey, thanks, Mom. And your dad really didn't do anything either. Yeah. You know, I mean, moral support, I guess. <laughs> Again, like when we're reading the Bible in Leviticus, why is the woman not celebrated? I'm ready to get into some of the other religions of uh, the celebrated female. Yeah, just celebrated human just the human aspect why all these uh, the bible is segregates in a massive way yeah there is no inclusion in the bible it's like uh, our political parties in america i mean we are just divided and that is exactly what the uh, old testament is so far a massive division which is unfortunate uh, in, in so many ways and that is why i like so many of these other philosophies that help me personally and, and a lot of the people that uh, join us are better for I mean just if Alan Watts his uh, many lectures if they were just a doctrine that everybody worshiped why would that be infinitely better than everything that I've read in the Bible well, there's a set of doctrines kind of like that. It's called Buddhism. Right, but he, but he, he explains it <laughs> yeah, in, in his own way that is just fantastic. And, but that's why we subscribe to uh, some of those philosophies. Everybody is uh, fearful of death and dying. I guess I, I, I no one is exempt from that, certainly not me. I, I was scared when we jumped out of the plane. Yeah. Well, not only are you scared of that, but you're scared of different things like uh, GMOs, pesticides, herbicides, any of those things, that is controlled by fear of death Why we got away from some of those things. Yeah, yeah, for sure. We don't, don't like to put harmful things in our body. Yeah, and that goes back to our other little project there, our sinless project, where we created a whole lot of good, nice things for you because we're afraid of death, or at least we're afraid of not living our best good life. Well, and, you know, we have to use, well, we don't have to, but you would like to think that everybody wants to use deodorant. <laughs> and, and so we created the best deodorant, and it works great. And we want to feel good about when we're done with it. That, you know, did the packaging, well, I know for a fact, you know, the packaging of my previous deodorants that I used is plastic. It's hard. Which never goes back. It's horrible. It's horrible to make. It's horrible to dispose of. And then the actual product in the container made out of just poison is harmful to my body. Which speaking, and I want to go into this because I, speaking of death and plastics, one thing that has always confused me because my own mother believes this, that when she dies, she does not want to go back into the earth. She wants to be put into a vault and, if possible, cemented into the ground so nothing ever gets to her. So she not only is she afraid of death and what comes after death, she's afraid of what her earthly human body is going to undergo. Now, for me, 
I would be perfectly happy digging a hole with a backhoe and throwing me in. <laughs> I mean, if I'm from earth to earth, go back to it. I have no qualms about death or what happens to my body. If there is something after, I'm not in it, so why would I care? Why not at least leave the earth with a nice little present that it gave me? Plant a tree and let it take its nutrients from my body. That's a very, that, that, that concept of what you just said instantly brought my mind to the thought of our bodies are fluid. And when I mean fluid, I mean they are constantly evolving and changing from the moment we were born to the moment we die. You were only left with the brain cells from our body. Those are the only cells that were born and die with. Every other cell is completely regenerated. We were totally different beings. Uh, you know, some scientists uh, say it's, you know, seven years. Some say that it's a little more than two, but it's probably the mixture of, because all of them do different things and change differently at different rates. But we consume, we consume everything that is of the earth. And we consume that as fuel. It in turn replicates in our body. It makes us, so we're never the same. We're always physically and literally different people. Our bodies are changing. We are morphing steadily into something we were not just a moment ago, just yesterday. And our bodies are going to, no matter what you do or try to hide, you cannot stop the natural process of your body changing. Your body came from nothing. It all of a sudden started to accumulate like a... Uh, I wanted to say like an a old woman in a house with a bunch of cats just starts <laughs> accumulating all this, you know, junk or, or a hoarder. And that, that's kind of what our bodies start doing as, as a child. You know, we just start accumulating this, this mass. Which is really something to think about is not only are we accumulating mass, but we're accumulating death. Yes. Whether you believe in eating animals or not to survive and sustain yourself you're consuming plants and where we're all afraid of death it takes death at every corner to sustain life even if you're a vegan i mean you are killing plants yeah you're you're killing and consuming plants and but they don't scream as loud as animals when they go down well that just raises another <laughs> very uh, important point is that there have been quite a few recent scientific studies of the frequencies and of plants and how they change basically EKGs put on to plants and as someone cuts down the neighboring piece of lettuce or the, pulls the apple from the tree uh, the other plants are actually screaming and they go off the charts uh, unless there's gratitude it makes a big big difference in how that evens out but which is one thing you know which i alluded to in our last discussion when i was talking about monoculture is so bad and i asked mr schmidt over here because he is a farmer and has a very large aquaponic system and an entire farm full of permaculture why and what and how and it just uh there has to be there has to be these things of uh, killing plants to survive it has to be um, I don't know any vegans. I know some people that like to eat a lot less meat. But no, let me take that back. We have some friends in India that are, are vegan, but one of them is... We're not, we're not vegan per se. They're vegetarian. Like for me, I generally do not eat meat. And that is not for any reasons of loving animals or anything like that. Quite honestly, meat is a terrible source of protein. It does not do any good... <laughs> I feel much better, have more energy. It's just personal. And but I would not try to convert anybody to it. If you want to ask me about it, that's great. If not, it doesn't bother me. But either. you still eat tuna fish. Occasionally, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm, or a steak. Yeah. I mean, it's not a full 100%. I'm completely against it. But for the most part, and more for me, it's just more sustainable. I love eating tuna fish. <laughs> tuna melts are pretty yeah, good. I love some tuna fish. <laughs> And I love eating a good steak. And now, every time I'm going to eat a steak, I'm going to be thinking, well, the biblical God, Jehovah, is going to instantly shoot out and kill me because I have a little, you know, there's a tiny bit of blood or something on my plate. Yeah, not the way you eat steak. He eats beef jerky. He eats it medium yeah. well. The way I <laughs> ate a steak is medium rare, so 
I want it a little bit closer to death than he does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just, uh, you know, there's just so many questions and fun stuff. And, you know, if you ever come out here and visit us at the farm, we're always, always these random sort of conversations come up in, in a philosophical context of, you know, for instance, Trey thought it would be fun for us to shoot a quick video on how we are governed by our fear of death. And I, I think that is a absolute truism. And there are all sorts of other topics that we jump into nonstop here. And, and probably many of them are worthy of video and a lot of people would find uh, fascinating. We just haven't got to that point. We just started with our... But that is a cue if anybody wants to shoot a reality TV show with some probably okay with it you know? <laughs> we're, probably, we're probably okay to watch all the time but we're not uh, we're not happy going oh hey look at me we're, we're just not those kind of people but we are very happy to say hey come look at these ideas these this thought process this way to uh, help better ourselves and our fellow man we're very keen on putting focuses on that for sure i love that word keen so keen on it. Well, I, it sounds to me like you've had a glass of wine. And no, I, I don't think that has anything to do. I think I'm going to go ahead and join you. I'm going to have my second one here because we do things in moderation. Because Trey has a bottle and so do I. Yeah, moderation. Moderation. You were not that afraid of death. No, uh, definitely not. Especially for you people that have contemplated jumping out of an airplane you just need to get over that fear and go do it. I forget the stats, but it's it's so low. I think 27 or something in the neighborhood below 30 people died parachuting out of three plus million. And the majority of those that died were suicide. So, you know, the chances of you getting in any harm by jumping out of an airplane is about zero. It's less than zero for sure not even jumping out of an airplane there's a lot of things that people are afraid of just going and experiencing other culture through travel oh yes for sure like when we went and so most of y'all may or may not know at the beginning of this year before everything got shut down kevin and i went to india and the middle east and qatar and when we before we went people were questioning like oh my gosh aren't you scared to go to the middle east and we're like, well no, it's Qatar. They're number one, the richest country on the entire planet. And two, if you act kind and respectful to most people, they will reciprocate that kind and respect to you. Well, and we weren't going in there with, uh, we weren't going into the Middle East with any sort of notion that we we're going to, oh, me big strong man, me, me not like you. You know, yeah. we, we didn't, and we didn't go in there with some naive, uh, conception that we could just be overly friendly to everybody and they're just going to like us. We just went in there nonchalant. Like we didn't really, Hey, we're going to be ourselves and that's all we're really doing. And if that offends you, then, you know, come get you some. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do have to say, and I do have to tell this little story about Mr. Schmidt over there flying over Iraq. When we're talking about fear of death, he got terrified and decided that it was probably a good idea to have the waitress be on standby for for him, for for his needs flying over Iraq. Because he got a little scared, so don't let anybody, don't let him fool you over there. For sure, and my needs were, I need another bottle of wine. Because <laughs> jumping out of an airplane is one thing, but going over Syria, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan. Well, you gotta qualify that too, <laughs> that when we're flying over uh, Iran. Was it three weeks before they shot a plane? Yeah, they just shot a, a plane and I was thinking, well, we're in their airspace and it just seems most unpleasant. <laughs> So yes, even us, we can be afraid of our fears but of death. I think that when you, when you talk of fear of death, I think some people are fear of, of traveling and going outside of their comfort zone because it's also a fear of the death of their own beliefs and their own concepts of what life is here. Oh yes, travel changes you on a fundamental level. Well, let me qualify that. If you let it, travel changes you on a fundamental level. A great story, and I like to take out of uh, Dan Brown's book, Inferno, 
they're standing in front of the gates of paradise, which Mr. Schmidt always has to call and remind me. And Dan Brown does a great story of an American tourist walking to the gates of paradise. And when you get there, it's almost separated with a chain link fence. And you have to wait in line to see these big, beautiful doors. And this woman walks up to it and says, oh, well, that's not anything special. That's like a chain link fence. Well, yeah, because you don't want it to be special. You're afraid of that death of your own system and beliefs. But if you wait and spend the time and patience to wait and gaze upon the actual gates of paradise, you will have the death of something. And it's also a rebirth of something else. So you can't be afraid of the death of your own ideas either. Yeah, the, uh, the, the fear of death really controls everything. And there's been countless times when we travel the globe that people, oh, I'm so worried about you. Oh, I can't believe, oh, you're going to Ecuador. You're going to India. You're, excuse me, you're going to the Middle East. You're going to South America. You know, wherever, wherever in the world it may be. Uh, I find it disturbing that, especially in the United States, more so in the United States than any other place that I've traveled. Like you can go to the poorest countries in Central and South America, and they are more broad-minded than and better travel and, and better traveled. But even the ones that never travel in those poorest of countries, when you come here, we have the idea that. Uh, whatever we are is so special and then to leave beyond the united states is a death of your own personal thought process whether you want it to be or not that's why most people don't do it one thing i've always found striking when we talk about not leaving or going somewhere i've been consumed later in life where i'm at now is why do people have pride in the state or the country of which they live you didn't have any choice in that. At some cases, especially if you're going out towards the West Coast, that's where your family's car ran out of gas and they decided to set up shop there. And then you're proud of it? I just don't understand. Most people don't make a conscious choice to live where they live. They were just born there or they were raised there and that's all they know and that's all they care about. Like, it doesn't make any sense to me. No, it doesn't make any sense at all. I do know that we do have flight from you know people that we live in uh, close to Shreveport, Louisiana, and then uh, in these small towns in East Texas, Marshall, Jefferson, we're here in Karnak. That is a glorious sound of wine being poured. You know, people want to get out, and they think they're being adventurous by going into a, just a. Nope, I keep doing hitting the thing. Moving to Dallas, or moving uh, to New Orleans, or Little Rock, or one of these bigger metropolitan areas and that you know that's a big change a big difference a big mind alteration our country's so gentrified now that everything's the same you stay in the same hotels you eat at the same restaurants you go to the same amusement parks basically the united states is a cookie cutter everything's the same it's bland oh it's very bland anywhere you go and now which really disheartens me is the whole world is becoming like that. When we went to India, the people that we went with thought it was a good idea to take us to McDonald's. And we're like, why would we go to McDonald's? Like, this is the craziest thing in the world. I mean, why? And if people do that. Even when they do travel, they seek out those spots. For that, comfort food. Yeah, for comfort. Yeah, I, I would rather no live on the edge. Yeah, I find no comfort in any of those things when I travel abroad. No, because if you're going to go somewhere, you need to go somewhere and not be afraid of what you might find. Well, that's a tragedy with this, um, whatever you'd like to call it. I like to call it just my personal preference. It's a scandemic. I think that uh, one, one tragedy of that is the one treasure that we have in this country is being choked out and that is the mom and pop restaurants that barely are surviving in the first place around the country uh, they're being wiped out on them in mass that is a tragedy and they're being driven to death it's not the fear of death for them they're being pushed in a great amount of expedience towards their death it is quite sad you're quite sad on every level.
But anyway, that's neither here nor there. I'm sure we've been rambling on enough, but you do get a taste and flair for what we kind of talk about and hang out with and uh, discuss in and out and before and after church. And uh, of course, for the next several months, we'll be locked into the to the Bible. And if it stays on this course, I'll be so happy when it's over. <laughs> uh, hopefully, it, it, it'll start to end on a happier note, but I... I know Revelation very well, so I know that's not going to end well. <laughs> but it's still going to be fun to re-explore because, as you, you read the Bible, but you were still younger. You're yeah, still young, still young now. I mean, you're in your mid thirties. It's been about ten years since I read it, and like I said in our recap, is uh, it seems a bit different now. Well, I read it whenever I was, and I don't remember exactly when, but it was in my very early twenties, and. But I had a whole different mindset and perspective. Yes, you had a, a whole different mindset and perspective because he gave me a book one time and he had some great notes jotted over the corners that are completely different than his way of thinking now. Oh, and it's funny sure. how we evolve as we get older. I mean, we think, again, going back to the fear of death, we should be more afraid of the life and what we get turned into. Oh, for sure. And I think that is why some people... Uh, are fearful of going to just check out another Christian denominated church. See, or in that go, case, I don't think they're so afraid of death. I think they're afraid of life and what they might find. They're comfortable when they found well, one city. Well, well, hold on, hold on. Which goes to the fear of death? They fear the death of their thought process, the, the, death death, of their ideas. the death of their ideas, the death of you know whatever their emotion is. And that rules us. That is, uh, our passions are ruled by the fear of death of something. And that is just a fact. There's no way around that. And those kind of things are what we end up talking about in depth on how to conquer those things, how to think about those things, how to talk to yourself. Uh, most people think it's crazy to talk to yourself. We really promote it because talking to yourself First of all, who else is going to listen to you better than you? <laughs> who else is going to do anything with you better than you? And you probably won't judge yourself. Well, and you might. And if you do, fine. If you don't, yeah. you know, that's your own problem. <laughs> <laughs> it just is what it is. Uh, I certainly hope you all enjoyed this. We're going to uh, wrap this up and we're going to go back to the study so we can do some editing and bring you all more content that we hope you all find fascinating. And I hope you enjoyed our sitting around uh, rambling and just come visit us yeah thanks again and remember with this last bit the closer to death and danger the farther from harm have a good day